Jelobani, Ninga Tulum Tulo, La Poso, Sangana Conagos of the Lavant. Jelobani, Ninga Tulum Tulo, La Poso, Sangana Conagos of the Lavant. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I trust that you all had a refreshing break. And we are now ready to head straight into the second and final discussion for the night. The session is entitled Outside Looking In with Sepi Atta, Leila Mahuan, and facilitated by Kwame Doors. Will the panel please take to the stage? Thank you. In the meantime, I have a book by Sepi Atta called Swallow and Leila Mahuan called The Sexual Life of an Islamist in Paris. Um, I unfortunately do not have any books for Kwame Doors because they are all sold out. <laughs> Thank you and enjoy. That's just because there were only three of them, that's all. <laughs> Good evening. How are you doing? Very, very good to be here with these two lovely ladies, or women. Sometimes you can't say ladies. <laughs> um, we're going to have a conversation, and we're also going to get a chance to hear them read some work. Um, and we hope that after we've, we've heard some work and talked a little bit, um, you'll be able to ask some questions and we'll have some discussion. So that's, that's the basic plan. Now what I'm about to do is I'm going to... By the way, if you've if you got a cell phone and you need to do that thing where you put it on vibrator, do that now. Um, but don't make any noises. <laughs> Other noises, you know. Um, but, you know, turn it off and all that. And then now I'm going to put on my, um, I've got one of these fancy phones. It's got one of these um, stopwatches. Um, and so I'm about to put on my stopwatch. Aren't you impressed? <laughs> yeah. So we're about to start. Um, we've got two writers here, Sefiata and Leila Maurani. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about them very briefly because you can read all the information about them in the program. And of course, you can Google them and they, all, they appear everywhere. These are well-known writers. Um, Leila was born in Nigeria. Leila is the one sitting beside me. Um, and she studied medicine and literature in Algiers. Um, she's published five novels. Is it five still? Six novels. See, you have to always ask these prolific people. Six novels, one collection of short stories. Is it one collection? Two. See? See what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, my, yeah, so my researchers are fired. Um, <clears throat> um, she's written about the oppression of women in, in, in Algeria, her home country. I think she's written about that amongst many other things. Uh, her latest novel that we have available to us, which is a beautiful book, um, I've started reading it and enjoyed it, The Sexual Life of, the, of an Islamist in Paris. And it's a good title. Um, if for nothing else, it'll make you want to read it. Um, she's won the Prix Jean-Claude Isso. We? Oui? That's perfect. My French is just so good. And... Um, <laughs> she's a promoter of... French, I, this is, I really want to talk to you a little bit about that, why you're promoting French, and she's a promoter of French, and she's also a publisher. Um, so we're going to have a, a wonderful conversation with Leila and hear her read. Um, was, the other person who is sitting over yonder is Sefi Atta. Sefi was born in Lagos, in Nigeria. Um, she went to university in the UK, and she trained as a chartered accountant. That's her professional life, yes. <laughs> chartered accountants in the house. Chartered accountants in the house. That's really great. Or is, that, is it that you're impressed that she's a chartered accountant? She's also a novelist. What's wrong with you people? <laughs> uh, she received an MFA in creative writing um, in the United States, Antioch University, was it? Yeah. And um, she's a full-time writer. She's uh, something that she's managed to do, which is quite remarkable and um, impressive. Um, she won the Shoyinka Prize, the inaugural Shoyinka Prize for Everything Good Will Come, 
Uh, she's also won the Noma Award for publishing in Africa for her, her novel, Swallow. Um, and how many novels have you published so far? Two novels. Two novels and a collection of short stories. That was what I got the Noma Award for. That's, oh, that, it, was for the, it was for Noma, right, for, for, this, for the, the short stories. Um, and then she also has a new, a new um, novel forthcoming as well as a new collection of, um, of plays. She's also a playwright and has had her work produced with the BBC. She's won awards for that and so on. So these are two really gifted writers uh, who've done very interesting things. And they have an interesting um, ways in which their journey is parallel. Um, and so I want to begin with a very odd and strange question. And I say this now in warning to you because I, I did sort of prep you that I would have a bunch of questions for you. And I'm sure you studied those carefully. Uh, and I'm ignoring them completely at this point. So. <laughs> My first question to both of you is, where would you want to be buried? Yes. Can I go first? Please do. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. I've actually thought about this many times. Mm. <laughs> Good. I'm married to a doctor, and I'm a huge hypochondriac. I always think I'm dying. <laughs> and it comes from a real fear. I lost my father when I was eight. Mm. And so I've thought about death, and I told my husband, I want, to be, um, I want to be buried in Nigeria, but I want to be cremated. Mm. And I told him to scatter my ashes on, on Lagos Lagoon. And he looked at me and he said, that dirty water, why would anyone <laughs> want their ashes to be sprinkled yeah. there? I've thought about this, yeah. So, so, but not Meridian, where you live? No, definitely not. Why not? I just don't want to be buried in Meridian, Mississippi. Yeah. I just don't want to be buried there. Okay, let, let, mm -hmm. Seth, I mean, Leila, tell us, what, what, when you think about that question, what, 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 what do you think? Um, I didn't think about it, but <laughs> <laughs> still young. <laughs> uh, I'm healthy. Yes, you're, you are very young. Um, maybe, maybe, I, uh, for sure, not maybe, for sure, uh, I would like to, to have a grave in uh, Paris, mm -hmm. in Montparnasse, mm -hmm. especially, uh, near, um, near my best authors, called Caricis, called Caricis mm -hmm. um, because of my son. My son is born, was born in Paris. He's growing up in Paris, so he is my only family. So. I don't want to, to be... To be separated? Yeah, voila. Right. I want some visits. And <laughs> <laughs> so a tombstone yeah. in Paris. Yeah. Yes. Please. Please. Good, good, good. <laughs> it's always an... Ask yourself that it's question. It's a testament. A testament, yes. yes, yes. It's, uh, yeah. it's South Africa, thing. it's amazing. Yeah. You like South Africa. But the, yeah. it's interesting to ask that question because it has a lot to do with your sense of what maybe a sense of what home becomes. And, and, and I, I decided to start with that question because, Leila, you, you have uh, managed this miracle of being born in two places. Yes. Could you explain to these people who are now wondering what I'm talking about? That's because uh, of exile. My parents you, um, ha have been exiled uh, during the, the Algerian war for independence, and they were uh, they they were fighting and uh, doing their their job, and um, they had to leave Algeria because um, because of the army, the French army, and um, they have been in Tunisia, in Djerba, a small island, no big island, but in my my, um, my mind, it's a small one, I don't know why. Uh, <clears throat> so it was in July when my parents arrived. It was uh, summer, very hot, because it's in the south of uh, the country. And, um, and I was born there. And my parents uh, were not married. They were very modern for the, their time and they decided not to, to marry because my, my father was Marxist and my mother was 
was following <laughs> his <laughs> ideas and she was okay with, uh, with that. And um, after that, uh, one year later, they had to move from Tunisia to Morocco because they, they, uh, they found them. Mm. So they have to escape, to, to go, to go from Tunisia to Morocco. And um, my, my brother was born in Meknes, a small town. Why a small town? No, it's a big town. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know why. Because of Paris. You Paris know, is so the, huge. The graves everything in Montparnasse. Just, everything is stuff. tiny like, after Paris. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. But New York, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, my brother was born in Meknes. And between uh, Meknes and Djerba, they used to live uh, in Rome, in Roma, in Italy, and in Spain. I was to six months, I think, um, and in Casablanca, in Morocco. And when they decided to marry because of the society, they, they, they were back to Algeria um, after the, after after, the, after the war, yeah. yeah, just after the war. Yeah. And, um, and they decided to marry in 1967 because of the family, both of the family, my parents, my father's family and my mother's family said, oh, oh la la, you are, you are not in the good, uh, the good way you have to marry for people. They decided to marry and, um, and to put us on, uh, on something, that, that, uh, that book, yeah, mm -hmm. voila. And uh, my, they decided to declare in Algeria our birth uh, in Algeria, in the place of the family where my grandfather and my, my all the family was born. All the family but my mother and my father. So uh, they symbolically, it was a symbol for my parents. And now, my brother and I, we have, we can have two certificates, excuse me, for the, for the certificates. certificates. <laughs> one, from, one from Tunisia for me. And Morocco from And here, Algeria here. for me, and my, my brother from Morocco and Algeria as well. Voilà, that's the, the story. It's, um, 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 it's something uh, amazing, but uh, it looks like a schizophrenia. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure... Uh, but when, when you write, do you write... I mean, in, in notes about you, they talk about your writing a lot about Algeria. You set a lot of your work in Algeria. Um, mm -hmm. so, so you lived there for a number of years yeah. and, and, and studied there. So do you write primarily about Algeria? Um, yeah. I lived in Algeria several, several many, many years. And um, I used to be a journalist. I worked as a journalist in a, a very hard contest, context mm -hmm. um, because of the censure, censure etc. And um, I, I'm writing fiction since I was a child. Oh, really? Yeah, 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 yes, uh -huh. yes, yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, it's since I was eight. I mean, my father is a writer too. Okay. And uh, for me, if, um, if you know how to write, you have to write. If not, how we can have books. I thought everybody is a writer. Uh. But I knew that I will be a doctor because my father and my mother said, you will be a doctor. I said, okay, I will be a doctor, but I have to write books. Um, I, I am the eldest, so I didn't have any example. And my parents were moving from place to place, so 
I didn't have any, I didn't know that uh, that writing is special or something. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and my mother stopped uh, school when she was 12 because of the war. She was 12 in uh, 1944 uh, and she stopped school. Um, she didn't uh, write, but she was uh, a good uh, storyteller. She was wonderful, and I think I'm telling a story, I hope so, telling stories like her. Sometimes my father says, uh, ah, you are a writer like your father. I say, no, but my style is um, close to my more mother. From, more, more from your mother, <laughs> yeah. 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 And um, what was the question? I know. I knew. I could sense. I could sense that it was happening. I. I, I got that feeling. You're a good storyteller, though. <laughs> no, but you. You answered my question because I was very interested in the idea of where you write about. And you, you've written about Algeria primarily, right? First of all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Y yes. Yes, I was a journalist in Algeria. <laughs> and I suffered of that censure. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't write every, what I, I saw, what I... Uh, and it was terrific. I don't want to... You, have, you can read the books if you want. Mm -hmm. And when I had to move from Algiers to Paris, um, and when my, mo my mother died, um, something happened uh, in, in my side. I generally, when normally, when you lose uh, a parent, a father or mother very early, you think about uh, to be a parent yourself. Mm. I didn't think about that. I said, I have to publish now my books. Uh. And I started my first novel uh, just after my mother death. And um, don't cry, <laughs> it's, it's uh, 20 years ago. Um, and I started that book, and I published uh, La Fille de la Casbah. Um, it's about the La Fille de la Casbah is telling Algiers mm -hmm. women, um, the army, the dictature, dictator, right. dictator, uh, dictator, mm -hmm. voilà, dictatorship, and um, and now with. Um, Book after book, I'm trying to tell something else right. than Algeria. Well, what happens? But is I cannot. You cannot. You're always there. But although your new novel is set in Paris, though, uh, the one you the, read, the, the, the one yeah. there, But I'm going to come back to that. But I'm going the to, one is mm. uh, is uh, I'm writing now. The novel is um, is uh, quite uh, already. Uh, my publisher is waiting there. for. Is again in Algeria. Back in Algeria. Yes. You but can't leave. No. You can't leave. No. No, why? Be even the sexual life yes. in is uh, the, the story is in Paris. The guy is, is from, Algeria, from Algeria. And he's telling Algeria. It's a, a jeu. I. It's mm -hmm. a first person. Mm -hmm. Voilà, the first person. And he is living in Paris. He is. Um, He's a Parisian man, but he's telling uh, Algeria and the culture and many things like that. Yeah. Okay. Why I cannot write for now? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe because, and I can, I can say it, uh, as a journalist, uh, I could write, um, for example, um, Articles, uh, reviews. Um, I, I went to the Nicaragua, for example. I, I could write many, many pages on the, the farmers there, and uh, 
because you have the material as a journalist and you, you, you just uh, write what you see, what you yeah. hear. But as a novelist, you have to um, take things, matters from your deep. Right. And I think my deep, my, my, my mind is still, is still in Algeria. Algeria. Yeah. Good. Now, we're going to have you read a little bit, but I'm going to ask, Sefi, in a, in a sense, most of your work is set in, in Lagos um, and in Nigeria as well even though you've been away from, from, from Nigeria back and forth um, for, for a long time. What, what draws you back to writing about Nigeria? Most of my published work is set in Lagos, Nigeria. I have written other... Um, set outside. Unpublished, yeah. Uh -huh. And the one that's coming out is actually set in England and mm -hmm. in Nigeria. And then um, book number five is set in the expat community in Nigeria. And book number six, which also hasn't been published, is set in the US. So I have written stories outside Nigeria, but I keep getting drawn back to um, my country of origin. And maybe it's just because I'm a neat thinker, you know? Mm -hmm. I lived there first, so um, right now I write about there mostly. And maybe at some point I'll write more about England and then the United States. Did I you say know. you're a neat thinker? I am a very neat thinker. What do you mean by a neat thinker? I, Within the bounds of my imagination, mm -hmm. um, so that I can get work done, I organize my thoughts. Otherwise, I won't get anything done. Wow. You know, and it doesn't mean my, my, my mind isn't wild. It doesn't mean that yeah. my imagination has no limits. But I do, I have a very organized way of thinking. Mm -hmm. You know, I have to be in a neat environment. I keep files for information. And You're an I, accountant. You know, <laughs> I, was, I was a lousy accountant. I really was. I would spend more time talking to people and finding out uh -huh. about their lives. You know, I just enjoy hearing about other people in the same way I've enjoyed um, Madame Leila very much, <laughs> you know. Yes. Well, let me tell you what we want to do. Leila, could you read, I want you to read a passage from the, 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 the sex book. Yeah, that one. Uh, the sexual life. And, and what, what Leila will read the passage, and then we, we're going to have a, a wonderful reader who you've, you've observed later. She'll read it in English, but it will be great to hear it in French, and we'll just hear some passages in French, and then we'll hear the English translation. Okay. So, um, I'm going to do my best. She's going best. to go, and... I'm yes. losing my French. <laughs> Your beautiful French. <laughs> The story um, is about a, a fairly young man. He's 40 years old, and he used to live with his mother, with his family, his mother and young brother. And he's um, educated. He has um, well, he has a good job. He, he works in a bank, and uh, he has money. He has many things. He's single. And he decided to leave his mother, his family, uh, from the banlieue. Do you know banlieue around Paris, uh, where uh, Arabs and black <laughs> live? He is Arab, um, and um, but he has a strange relationship with his mother. His mother is uh, like. Uh, Wolf, uh, female wolf. Um, so he moved. He moved from uh, Saint Ouen, which, which is in the banlieue, to Saint Germain, and you can notice Saint Ouen, Saint Germain. Saint means, um, um, you know, the saint. saint. Très bien. Merci beaucoup. Uh, and um, his mother was not very happy when he moved, but she couldn't do anything. And every Sunday, she calls him. She calls him to, to remind him that he has to, to eat the couscous at home. And, 
And voila, I'm going to read one of the, these uh, Sundays in French. Le dimanche suivant, dit-il, je rêvais à une vierge tout de rose vêtue quand la sonnerie du téléphone m'a réveillée. Alors que je décrochais, je l'ai senti qui bougeait et qui me frôlait. Mais non, elle n'était pas que dans mon rêve. Elle était là. Elle avait refusé de m'accompagner à la soirée de Driss. Elle n'aimait pas ça, les fêtes. On pouvait tomber sur n'importe qui. Et Driss, que nous avions croisé au flore, ne lui inspirait pas vraiment confiance, m'avait-elle confié. Mais elle avait accepté de dîner chez moi, à la maison. « Parce que tu sais faire la cuisine » m'avait-elle demandé en guise de consentement. Elle était donc là, dans mon lit. Et ma mère qui insistait au téléphone. « Bonjour ma mère. Euh, »« Bonjour ma mère. »« C'est ok. »« Bonjour ma mère. »« Pourquoi est-ce que tu chuchotes ?» À cause du chat, ma mère. Parce que tu as un chat Oui, ma mère. Enfin, c'est provisoire. Je le garde pour des voisins partis en vacances. Et depuis quand faut-il chuchoter en présence d'un chat C'est un chat de race, ma mère. Très sensible au bruit. Elle a de nouveau bougé, puis tel un félin, elle a sauté hors du lit. Dans son pyjama de coton rose, elle s'est précipitée dans la salle de bain. J'accusais le flot de paroles de ma mère quand, enroulée dans une serviette, les cheveux mouillés, elle a réapparu. J'ai tenté de lui faire un signe, me donnant le dos sans laisser tomber la serviette. Avec une vélocité et une agilité de magicienne, elle a réussi à se rhabiller sans qu'une parcelle de sa peau fût à mes yeux gourmand dévoilée. Puis, et comme si le diable était à ses trousses, elle a quitté la chambre. Je l'ai entendue dans la cuisine qui actionnait la machine à café. « Excuse-moi, ma mère, je dois le raccrocher. Pas avant que j'ai fini ce que j'ai à te dire. Ne quitte pas, ma mère, le chat. Le chat est en train de se sauver. » Au moment où je sautais du lit, la porte d'entrée a claqué. J'ai repris le cabinet, euh, le combiné, excusez-moi. Il s'est sauvé, ma mère. Le chat s'est sauvé, et je dis sans réprimer un hoquet proche du sanglot. Rattrape-le, mais n'oublie pas de venir, prunelle de mes yeux. Tu me manques, lumière de mes jours. That's enough. And translated into English, that reads... The following Sunday, he said, I was dreaming about a virgin dressed in pink when the telephone awoke me. As I was picking up the receiver, I could feel her moving, rubbing against me. Yes, indeed, she is here, in my bed, between my sheets. She had refused to go with me to Dries's party. She didn't like that sort of thing, parties. You never knew who would be there, and Dries, <laughs> whom we'd run into at Flore, did not seem trustworthy to her. She confessed, but she agreed to come to dinner at my house because you know how to cook, she had asked, by way of consent. Good morning, mother. Why are you whispering? Because the cat, my mother. You, you have a cat now? Yes, my mother, well, it's only temporary. I'm looking after him for my neighbors while they're on vacation. And since when do you have to whisper around cats? <laughs> um, it's a pedigree cat, my mother, and it's very sensitive to noise. She moved again and, like a feline, jumped out of the bed in her pink cotton pajamas. She rushed into the bathroom. I was resisting the onslaught of my mother's words when, wrapped in a towel, her hair wet, she reappeared. I tried to motion to her, but turning her back to me without dropping her towel and with magician speed and agility, 
she managed to get dressed without allowing a single morsel of skin to fall prey to my avaricious eyes. Then, as if she had the devil at her heels, she left the bedroom. I heard her in the kitchen using the coffee machine. Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me, mother, I have to hang up. Not until you hear what I have to say. Hold the line, mother. The cat is sneaking out the door. <laughs> the moment I jumped out of bed, I heard the front door slam. I picked up the receiver. He got away, my mother. The cat got away. I said, making no effort to restrain a hiccup that was very close to a sob. Well, go get him, but don't forget to come. Apple of my eye, I miss you. Light of my days. Uh, 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 merci beaucoup. Yes. <laughs> Bravo. Very good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Sefi, I would ask you to read um, from your collection of short stories. And uh, yes, go ahead. My excerpt seems longer than hers. Well, make it shorter. <laughs> 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 it's me, it's my fault, but yes. Mm -hmm. Hello everyone, please wake up for me. <laughs> okay. Lubna is waiting for me under the old acacia in town. We bet with pebbles over there. I always win. She's smarter in school because she has a longer memory. Allah, she can even remember what happened to her 10 years ago when she was a baby. But she loses our pebble bets every time because I'm much faster at thinking ahead. I stand in a gap under the shadows of the tree branches and shield my eyes from the sunlight. Anyone looking at me might think I'm crying. There was a bus crash last night. Allah, she says, Allah, where? By Gandubu. Gandubu is settlement two. Our town is settlement five. We are, we, are small settlement, <laughs> we are small settlement towns in this part of Nigeria. The capital city is miles away. The ground is covered with flattened cardboard boxes on which the taxi drivers have taken naps in the shade. Now the drivers are gathered around the community tap by the mosque on the other side of the street. They are filled with plastic kettles to perform ablution and leave wet patches in the soil. Soon it will be time for afternoon prayers. Men can attend, and boys too. Women have their own separate section to share with girls. But we are not allowed to participate in Friday prayers, not since our Sarki Baraki banned us. Did you bring any kilishi? Lubna asks. She's sitting under a hump of the tree root. Her hair is covered with a scarf, as mine is. She wears a nose ring, but I don't care much for them, because whenever I sneeze, they get sticky with mucus. I raise my hand. Are you listening? I said there's another crash on the expressway. A bus overturned. People perished. And all you can think of at a time like this is Kilishi. Sometimes I have to wonder. This is precisely why she always needs to take rest and why she uses double the cloth I use when our tailor sews her up and downs. Lubna eats too much. Kilishi is delicious with Coca-Cola. Chewy. The strips burn your tongue, work your back gums, and scrape off your inner cheeks. I'm just asking, she says. You, you're never satisfied. I can't help feeling hungry. Well, food is not always the answer. Was anyone in our town on the bus? No. Not once. Still, it is her lack of respect for the dead that I cannot tolerate. She ought to know. We're not that young. Last year, my husband was killed on the expressway. He and I had been betrothed for several years. He was 42 and prosperous with older wives. Mama was bereft. His surviving brother was a drunk. I should have been passed on to him as part of my husband's inheritance, but Baba refused. That useless one, with his breath always thinking of Burukutu, he said, I would rather give my daughter away to a goat. They say the driver's head rolled into a ditch, I explained to Lubna. They say he wasn't properly secured. They say he will be buried tomorrow, and once he's wrapped up in cloth, no one will know the difference. I overheard that from Mama. She sent me out to play. She thought I would be too scared to listen, but I wasn't scared. 
This is not the first crash we've had on the expressway to the capital. We call it the death road around here. And anyway, there was a Christian woman who was burned this year. She refused to step aside for a group of men walking into the mosque for Friday prayers. They asked her nicely, and she made the sign of the cross. That wasn't necessary. But I agree with Mama that the men went too far. They needn't have set her on fire. They could simply have beaten her up. Baba said she was being unreasonable. She should have stepped aside. Remember the Christian woman? I asked Lubna. She nods. Everyone remembers the Christian woman, even though we'd rather not talk about her. Bint has seen a body burn before, she said. She says, her math teacher at government college. He was an Indian man from Calcutta, and when he died, his family burned him to ashes on the school grounds, and the senior prefects were allowed to watch. Allah? Allah. I doubt that. Binta is her elder sister by her father's junior wife. Major trouble, if you ask me. She was supposed to be betrothed to my brother Hassan, the firstborn of my father's senior wife. Our families agreed to the union, but Binta refused. She said Hassan's head was shaped like a cashew nut. She was about our age when she ran off to Sokoto and stayed with a guardian there. After her secondary education at government college, she escaped to a teacher's training college in Zaria. Did Binta end up um, teaching? No. She got a job with a non-governmental in the capital that stops girls from marrying and gives them scholarships. A woman like her from a respectable family. It was a scandal. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Sefi. Um, we've got just a few more minutes, and so what I thought I would do is, I, I want to ask Sefi, you know, your piece gives us a sense of your, 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 your dialogue, your use of dialogue and so on, and you, 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 you write plays, or you've written plays, and you're writing plays. Can you tell us a little bit about your playwriting and the, the new collection of plays that you have um, due to come out? Right. Um, th the first thing I ever wrote were radio plays, and I couldn't get them produced in Nigeria. It was a difficult time in Nigeria when I started writing. We were the Abacha regime, military regime, and there wasn't much money or funding for the arts. So I sent it off to the BBC and for a competition, and it won second prize, and they um, broadcast it on the radio. I did that again two years later, and they broadcast my next play. And then I thought, okay, maybe I can do this, you know, and I continue to write plays. Um, difficult to get funding. I, while I was writing my novels, I would just um, ask around, submit them in Lagos, and there was always um, doors being closed, rejections, etc. Luckily for me, um, last year, I somehow or the other, I, I, I met up with um, an old friend of mine. I'd been to school with him 30 years ago, and he was a director. So he read one of my plays, and he thought he'd like to produce it in Lagos. I had to produce it myself. And then the next one, he submitted to a theater in Germany, and it got... Um, it got produced Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, it will run for two years. Um, I went there for the premiere. So it's been an accident, really, mm. my playwriting, and I've enjoyed it thoroughly. It's, I think, probably the riskiest thing I've done as a writer, because if a play is not produced, is it a play? I, I <laughs> That's know. right. It's yeah. a good question. Yeah. Good. And, 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 and Leila, I, um, I want to just, you know, as a, as a last thought, because I'm very interested in the idea that you're writing about the, the, the experiences of women, the struggles of women. Um, how does your latest, this novel that you read from, address those questions. We see the, the mother as a figure, we see the, guy, the woman that he has a relationship with as a figure. But how, how do those, this, does this novel begin to address some of the issues that, are, that remain very important to you in your work? Yes, in, the, in, this, in, this, in this book. The microphone. Mm. We talked about caves and now. <coughs> Bon, je vais boire de l'eau. You're not dying, yeah, trust the, me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not sure. <laughs> and you brought up the cats, it wasn't me. No, the, the, <laughs> no, no, no. never um, The book, the narrative person, the mm. protagonist is a man. Yes. But it's just a, an alibi. 
he, he is a man telling women right. because he is in, in the middle of a, a kind of a gynécé uh, harem, uh, a gynécé harem. harem. Uh, yes? Harem, but a modern one. Modern harem, yes. A lot modern of women one. around him. Voilà, a lot mm. of... It's, for me, it's a, a kind of way to tell again and again uh, women with, uh, with what they have, what they live, what, uh, through a man, through uh, a um, regard, through um, a, a, a sight, a sight of around. a man. Mm. Um, for me, it's not, uh, yeah, many people say, oh, how can, can she talk like that about a man? Because he, he looks real, yeah. Mm -hmm. he, he is acting uh, like a man. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I always say, no, he, he, is, uh, he looks true because what he is telling us about women is true. Mm. Uh, voilà. And it was important for me also to, because all my books, I have the same universe. I am that kind of writer, that sort of writer, who, who is always um, um, working in this, on the same theme mm -hmm. with um, several characters, of course, book after book, mm. novel after book. I'm going, uh, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to stop you. Yes, please. Because I think you've answered it very well. Because I think what is interesting is that you're able to write this male character convincingly, and yet his experiences is, is an interesting angle to talk about women. I mm. think that's, that's beautiful. We have a couple of minutes, and I can take two questions, one at a time. Now, I, I have to finish something, maybe. Mm. No, just something. Because yeah. I, I'm also... Um, in the book, we have the intimacy of the, the man. Yeah. All my books, my, my first books, are around intimacy of women, the, the body the, yes. of the Intim women. Intima the, uh, yeah. the woman's body. Uh, mm. Woman's body, yeah. And then I say why we are always talking about how a woman is... Um, is uh, acting with her body mm -hmm. and uh, acting with freedom, why not a man? Why? Uh, because that man wants to get freedom from family, okay. traditions, etc. Mm -hmm. voilà, tout ce yeah. que Good. All right. Um, so we can take two questions, one at a time. And, and um, so I can't see you. I can see you. So, does anybody have a question? No. Okay, good. That's a very that's very nice news. Good. What happened? Any, no, it's okay. It's all we are safe. <laughs> she just wanted to talk to me afterwards. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Lord of mercy. Okay, are there any questions? By the way, um, somebody can watch to see if there are any hands that go up. I'm really, I have awful eyesight. So is there anybody with a question? No? Where? where? Okay, go ahead. Hi. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I can't see. Honestly, I can't. Hi. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Um, good evening. Um, I just wanted to find out, uh, I'm actually a film producer and, uh, you know, uh, I wanted to find out what is the difference, you know, a writer uh, of a novel would apply if he or she has to apply the creativity on a film script. And one more question is... Well, let's, let's clarify that question. Right. Your question is, what would a writer have to do to do what? To make a film script? No, to, uh, what, what is the format that he, would, he or she would have to follow? if he has to change? Or what, what do you see in today's films that is wrongly depicted and the format that we, producers or directors, need to follow 
as a writer, as a creator. How do you adapt a, a novel into a, a screenplay? Well, I would have thought, just adapt it well. I, I don't know, I can't uh, answer that question. It's, it's very difficult to adapt a novel to a screenplay. And a friend of mine asked if he could do that with my first novel, and I said no, because I didn't see how it would work. Um, a play to a screenplay is less difficult, is what I'll say. I don't know. I've really not watched many films that I've enjoyed as much as I've enjoyed the novels. So obviously, it's a difficult thing to do, and people don't always get it right. I don't know. I don't have any advice to give you. Leila, Leila has not, they, have they been adapted? It's not nice for people who are making films. Um, no, I think uh, I, I'm writing scripts uh, only um, for money. Um, <coughs> uh, and uh, I, I write a script, um, one script every year. Uh, it's very quickly, uh, it's, a, it's a fiction. Like a, like a novel, but it's, uh, you have to respect jour uh, intérieur, you have to know some technical words, and you have to, to be good in dialogues, and that's it. I mean, but when a script is uh, not from, um, uh, uh, I wrote, uh, um, write, I write scripts, not from uh, a novel. Mm. They give me what we call in France a Bible, a um, story, very short story uh, with characters, and we, they tell me, yes, you, this is uh, the story, and you have to develop it, okay, uh, on 150, 50, um, Pages. Um, for me, uh, it, it's easy to do it because uh, I, we can. Everybody, I mean, who who has time to do it, uh, it. Uh, I I spend one month on a script, comparing to a novel, who took me uh, between six and two years sometimes. Voilà. Uh, but the question is, we uh, have, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Yes, Safi. <laughs> Other questions? Is anything happening? Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> My question is for Safi Atta. Uh, Reading the title of your book, the other one says swallow, and the other one is saying everything good will come. And in the interview, you've just said that some of the things you wrote were not published. And if you write something and you're like not getting it done, do you have to swallow that you did something and it was not done? And whenever everything good comes, is it because you are happy with your success and not going back to what you lost? You just wrote a poem. <laughs> and you must pay her royalties because you're using her lines. <laughs> with, That's with, a good question. With Can... two titles that I actually don't like very much. <laughs> but there you go. Um, when I said my books were not published, they're not published yet. You know, It takes me a while to revise. I, I've made the mistake in the past of submitting work when it's not ready. And the result was um, rejection, so I'm taking my time. Um, do I give up on certain works? Yes, I do, a lot of them. It's heartbreaking. There's nothing worse than investing your imagination in characters and people, getting that energy up and then having to let it go. I, I can't imagine, well, maybe some men, I don't know, what's the average age group here, might feel that way with women when they can't, get the woman they want just at the moment they want her. That's how disappointing it is to me, <laughs> you know? And I, I, I feel very let down. I hope the adults can understand what I mean. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, um, 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's a difficult one to swallow the failures. Um, but that's part of writing life. You, you live with it. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Okay, so I'll take one more question and then we'll wrap up, okay? Is there one more? If not, yes? Yes, there's one more. Let's hear it. Hello. Um, Hello. Uh, I'd just like to ask uh, the two uh, writers whether they read any of the, their indigenous, knowledge, uh, indigenous language novels and how much, or do they read in French and English only? Thanks. If he's asking if you read your indigenous language, but that's French, please. <laughs> I think I think Leila does. Um, <laughs> but Sefi, you no, I'm an yeah. illiterate Yoruba. Unfortunately, I don't read Yoruba. Mm -hmm. I'm an, oh, I'm an illiterate Yoruba, which is my language. I don't read Yoruba. She's I just illiterate don't. <laughs> in the language. I'm an illiterate. She's, she doesn't know how to read the language. Mm. Folks, it's a political thing. Listen, thank you all very much, and thank you, Sefi and Leila. All right, and that's a wrap, ladies and gentlemen. I'd really like to thank our panelists and facilitators for their participation this evening, and to all our writers for attending, and to your audience, thank you for your attendance and your support. Um, please follow us on Twitter, at Tim of the Writer, and find us on Facebook, and like our page. All right, <laughs> thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Have a safe trip home, and good night. <laughs>